Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is your favorite gun channel in beautiful, bright, hunglish language. It's cap and ball again. And the gun I have in my hands is a very special piece. It's a capping breech loader, an early breech loading rifle, a carbine, a cavalry carbine, straight from the American Civil War. It's called the Gwyn and Campbell, or the Union, or the Cosmopolitan, or the Grapevine, or whatever. We will find it out. This is quite an interesting piece. It shows the creativity of those gun makers who were operating in the middle of the 19th century at the time of the transition from muzzle loaders to breech loaders. So ladies and gentlemen, this ugly duckling has an interesting history. So let's immerse into this history and the history of the American US cavalry during the American Civil War with Cap and Ball. But before we go on, let me thank you for your support, your donations through Patreon, or buying our authentic American Civil War cartridge boxes and percussion revolver cartridge formers or our US Arsenal Stadia rangefinders, or a rubber printing place for Arsenal cartridge bundles, or our new 18th century volumetric powder measures, or our authentic hand-forged flintlock multi-tools, or our Civil War powder measure sets, they all help to keep the quality of our channel high. Without you, this would be much more difficult. So thank you very much again. Please visit our web store for further information about our products. During the American Civil War, there were many carbine designs in parallel in service in the American cavalry. And the reason behind this was uh, very simple. Actually, there were two basic reasons behind it. The first one was that the cavalry arm was something like a research laboratory for the ordnance department. They tried out each and every single concept that was considered for the whole army as well. And the breech loaders were, were there by that time, so it was obvious to try them out at a smaller scale. The second reason behind it was a logistics reason, because the cavalry arm was grown so fast at the beginning of the conflict that they needed every single firearm that they could grab, which made it easy for the inventors, for the gun makers to push a new concept into, the, into service. And the cavalry arm was a perfect choice for this, because a cavalryman needs a beach loader, because it's much easier to load than a muzzle loader, it's easier to handle on horseback. So that was a quite interesting time. But what is a capping breech loader? A capping breech loader is an early breech loading firearm, so you don't anymore load it from the direction of the muzzle, but you can open the breech by pulling this lever. It opens the breech, you put in the cartridge, you close the breech, and after that you put a separate percussion cap on the nipple, and then you can fire the gun, which means that the powder and the ball are united in a paper cartridge or linen cartridge, and then the primer is a separate item. So the breech loading concept offered a convenient and formidable arm for the cavalry that could be easily handled, much more easily handled on horseback than the muzzle loaders. But the most important question for all the percussion breech loaders was how to seal the breech between the bolt and the barrel. Because we don't have a brass case here. In modern firearms, the brass casing of the cartridge is the one that is sealing the gases that are trying to break back to the face of the shooter. The brass case expands in the chamber and completely seals the breech. Well, we don't have that here. So you have to be very clever and very creative to find ways to at least ease that problem and at least not have black powder gases burning the face of the shooter. You have to be very creative. Many inventors, gun makers try to solve this issue, but to tell you the truth, none of them was able to do so. So when there's a paper cartridge in the chamber, it is very hard to seal the breech and it does not depend if it's a sharps or any kind of other breech loading, capping breech loading concept, it will leak a bit at the joint. My cartridges are close copies of original cartridges. The majority of the original Civil War cartridges were charged with 40 grains of black powder with granulation somewhere between 1.5 and 2F. My powder load is 40 grains of 2F Swiss powder and a 0.518 caliber Smith bullet cast with the excellent and authentic Erascon mold. As with the other carbine designs, I started my shooting session at 30 meters.
let's check it. And this is definitely not bad, ladies and gentlemen. The distance is 30 meters and all the five shots are, let's say, in the size of a 10 ring, which is quite good for an old carbine like this. The bore is good. Let's not forget that the bore is good. The sight is tricky. It doesn't really correspond to how I should be using this rifle. Okay, so I was using for the first shot here the, the, the basic sight, the normal iron sight, and then I switched to the leather and used the lowest position of the ladder, so none of them really hits in the center of the target, but that can be a, uh, because of my cartridge as well, so it is not the problem of the carbine or the sight, but, uh, but the group is good. Let's try it at 50 meters as well. The birth date of the Queen and Candle carbine is 1856, when Henry Gross, a gunmaker in Tiffin, Ohio, submitted a patent for a breech holding mechanism. He teamed up with his brother Charles and established Gross Arms Company and they submitted a carbine, a breech loading carbine, for the trials at West Point in 1857. Well, their gun was considered a solid and strong design, but it was stated that it leaked gas at the joint, so it was not recommended. John A. Dahlgren received two pieces for further testing and uh, one of them failed to fire after a few dozens of shots. The other one, well, that fired 500 shots in a row, which was a good result. But still, Dagren was not satisfied. He stated that the system is inferior compared to the Maynard, Burnside and Jocelyn carbines. Later, these carbines were tested by the Springfield Arsenal as well, with the same results. The original 1856 Gross patent shows a mechanism that is very close in function to the Kammerlader concept. The breech moves back and opens upwards. The axis is close to the back end of the breech piece. The joint is sealed by a sleeve at the barrel breech that engages its recess at the mouth of the breech piece. The cartridge is loaded into the chamber piece. This gun was fired with a tape priming system. The 1859 gross patent is much closer to the Burnside system. The breech piece opens upwards again but the axis is close to the middle of the breech, so its mouth does not elevate above the axis of the bore as much as it was in the case of the 1856 patent breech. The sleeve is now located on the mouth of the chamber piece and engages its recess at the barrel breech. The cartridge was loaded into the chamber piece. This model was fired with standard percussion cap placed on the nipple. So the carbine was not recommended at all. But then came the Civil War that changed everything. In 1861, the Cosmopolitan Arms Company acquired the rights to produce the gross patent breeches. This company was established by Abner Carruthers Campbell and Edward Quinn in Hamilton, Ohio in 1859. Campbell's brother had a good personal relationship with the governor of Illinois and with his support, the army ordered 1,140 pieces at 27 US dollars apiece instead of all the bad results that they had at the previous trials. Politics. The government asked for some minor changes. For example, they asked for the strengthening of the action. For the receiver, they asked them to use rough iron instead of malleable. They also asked to work away all the sharp edges of the carbine, and they also asked to increase the metal in front of the lock plate. The carbines from the first order batch were issued to the 6th Illinois Cavalry. They featured the gross pattern breech, and they were marked Cosmopolitan Arms Company, Hamilton, Ohio, United States, Grassy's Patent, 1859. And these carbines were shipped between June 1862 and July 1862, and after the first order was completed, five more orders came up until the end of the Civil War. During its production time, there were many minor modifications to the system, but the most important one came in 1862, when Edward Quinn submitted a patent for a new action. The reason for this was probably to strengthen the, the, the locking mechanism, but probably also to get rid of the royalty that they had to pay for gross, which is also an important reason for sure. The one you see in my hands is the last model. This was manufactured in 1864, October, November. This is a Gwyn and Campbell Type 2 model. We call this carbine from that point, from 1860, to a Gwyn and Campbell carbine because they are marked Gwyn and Campbell on the lock plate. Uh, it is easily distinguishable because uh, we have a flat-faced large hammer here. This is, this is a very good sign of that this is the last model. And also the form of the lever is different. It is not curved back at the end and the lever catch is also different from the previous models. So this is a Type 2, the last model. 
The Gwyn and Campbell pattern bridge had nearly nothing in common with the Gross bridge. This was not the camera ladder concept anymore. The cartridge was loaded directly into the breech of the barrel. The heart of the action is a solid breech block that falls down to open the breech and that moves up and forward when closing it. The cylindrical front of the breech block pushes the cartridge into the chamber, while it also locks the action and somewhat seals the gases. This breech block is moved by the excenter cylindrical part of the operating lever. This is actually a simple and strong mechanism. Cosmopolitan Arms furnished 100 cartridges for each and every single carbine they sold to the US Army. And they also sold extra quantities of cartridges, of course. We don't exactly know if these were made in-house or they bought it from a local factory or something. But we do know that the initial price for these cartridges was 15 US dollars per 1000 pieces and they were boxed in boxes of 50, perforated boxes of 50. At the end of the conflict in 1864, the price was risen, was grown to 24 US dollars per 1000 pieces. And the chief of ordnance technically thought that these are inflated prices. So from the August of 1864, they decided to manufacture cartridges in the state-owned arsenals as well, especially at St. Louis, where they manufactured cartridges with linen and paper cases. The bullets in these cartridges uh, were uh, uh, flat bullets, so they did not have grease grooves, and their weight was between 290 and 390 grains. And their caliber was also varying between 50 and 54 caliber, so there was quite a large variation of cartridges. But there are very, very few cartridges that actually remained in collections today. The making of these cartridges was exactly the same as it was done with other carbine cartridges. First, the paper or the linen case was rolled on a mandrel, it, the seam was closed with glue paste, the base, the paper base, was added also secured with glue, then it was filled with 40 grains of powder, and for the last, the bullet was glued into the mouth of this cartridge case. Altogether, 5.3 million cartridges were purchased by the US Army for the Gwyn and Cable carbines, but there are very few that I can actually show you in picture. There is one in Thomas B. Rentschler's excellent book about the Gwyn and Cable carbines on page 71. That's a linen case cartridge. It also shows us two bullets that were dug, and they are also flat bullets, which means they don't have the grease grooves. And there are some also in Dean S. Thomas's excellent book, Rumble to Rim Fire, second part. That's on page 53 and 52. We see quite a few cartridges here. Three linen and one paper cartridges with the same kind of bullets that actually do not have any grease grooves, and it also shows the Lovell Arms cartridges here, but these are post-war cartridges, so they are not manufactured during the Civil War, but they were later made. These post-war cartridges now, they hold actually grease groove bullets. This is actually what I reproduced with my, let's say, nearly history uh, cartridges. Making the combustible envelope cartridge is quite easy. The paper I'm using is hair curling paper, but to be honest, any thin paper will work. You won't have to nitrate the paper. It will burn properly if it is thin enough. I fired 40 shots and there was no need to clean the chamber from powder residue. Roll the paper on a mandrel closely matching the bullet diameter and close the seam with glue. Now add some glue to the base edge of the cartridge and place a 2.5 cm disc to the bottom and secure it. Now it will be the time to fill the powder charge. Now the powder will be measured with a special tool. This is the exact reproduction of an 18th century volumetric powder measure. I actually have the original. The original was found in the patch box of a model 1769 Austrian Jägerstützen rifle. That's a military flintlock rifle. This is adjustable with this beautiful metal key here. And you can mark the pistol, piston wherever you want, so you can set it for your exact powder charge that your rifle likes. And it is up to the millimeter a perfect reproduction of the original. And we have this for sale for you. You can find it in our eBay store and also in our web store as well. I already marked my powder measure to drop 40 grains of 2F Swiss powder.
Apply some glue to the second ring of the bullet. If you don't put glue on the bottom ring, it will be much easier to guide the bullet firmly on the powder. The last phase is to add the lubrication. I use a traditional mix of beeswax and tallow for deep lubing the cartridges. Every historical shooting session deserves properly packaged cartridges, like this one here for the Union Carbine. This is holding 10 cartridges and 12 caps. I made this using our rubber printing plates for Arsenal cartridge bundles. And let me show you now how to make these authentic packages that will actually open with a string like in the 19th century. The making of the cartridge bundle starts with assembling the carton box. I made a template so I can reproduce it easily for further carbon testings. Now let's make the wrapping paper. I will be using a rubber printing plate designed for lava cartridges. Just glue it on a wood block, put some ink on it, and on a book as a support, press it firmly on the paper sheet. There we go, a perfect label. Now let's glue the wrapping paper on the lid and the back of the box with placing it correctly so the label will be exactly on the top of the lid. Now we'll make the opening string. Put a bit of glue inside the corner of the box. This will anchor the string. Then pull a line of glue all around the edge of the lid. Tie a knot to the end of the string and secure it at the corner with glue. Then guide the string all around the edge of the lid. Now punch a hole so you can guide the string on the outside of the wrapping paper. And place the 10 cartridges in alternating position into the box. Now roll a paper tube for the caps just as you were rolling a paper cartridge and fill it with 12 caps.
When you're done, finish closing your box with the wrapping paper. Well, of course, when you open it, you destroy it. But this gives a magic touch to these historical shooting sessions. I love that. Let's check the group of the carbine and the cartridge now at 50 meters. And this is the 50 meter group, ladies and gentlemen. The first shot was very high, it flew over the target, but all the other four are in the target. The group is not that good because I had to aim somewhere here into, into Nowhere's Land because, uh, because, because the sights are just not proper for this distance. So, but anyway, you can hit the man size target at 50 meters with the carbine still, which is okay. The carbine did not need any cleaning between the shots, but some minor paper residue remained in the chamber after 15 shots. This, however, did not block the chambering of the new cartridge. By the fall of 1864, the cost for a carbine like this was 22.5 US dollars, while 1000 cartridges cost 24 US dollars for the government. The total number of gross cosmopolitan Green and Campbell carbines purchased by the federal government could be around 8400. Let's see now the technical parameters of the carbine. The total length of the carbine is 98 centimeters or 39 inches. The length of the barrel is 50.8 centimeters or 20 inches. 
I slug the board to determine the exact caliber. Between the grooves it is 0.532 inches and between the lens it is 0.504-505 inches. We have three grooves with a right hand twist and the twist rate of the bore is around 1 turn in 50 inches or 1 turn in 52 inches. The weight of the carbine is 6 pounds and 8 ounces. The sights are regulated for shooting up to 600 yards, but that's quite over optimistic. The tactical distance for a carbine could not be more than 70 80 meters maximum. The 535 round ball I use for my 54 caliber flintlock rifles fills the grooves completely, so I decided to make some round ball cartridges as well with the same 40 grain powder charge. Let's see the round ball cartridges at 30 meters. Well, the recoil is significantly less. Let's check the target. Well, I understand that people don't like it, but this carbon is not bad at all. With the round ball, five shots are, let's say, nearly <laughs> the size of a ten ring. Okay, it's 30 meters only, but that was the tactical distance for a cavalry carbine, ladies and gentlemen. And from that distance, this is perfect. This is perfect. Yeah, I love it. And the round ball does not have any kind of recoil. The, the 535 round ball is accessible everywhere. That's good, it's good. Well, my carbine looks a bit war weary. It was manufactured in October, November 1864, and it has a cartouche of WHR, which stands for William H. Russell, the principal inspector for accepting the arms. And uh, although from the outside, well, it doesn't look perfect, the bore is mint. It's just beautiful. See this? beautiful and shiny. So this carbine will still make a good companion for a historical shooting session. Just as in the case of all other Civil War carbines, the opinion about the Gwyn and Campbell breech loading carbine was quite controversial. There were some who liked it, and there were some who said that whoever adopted this for military service should be hanged. So business as usual, just in the case of all the other percussion breech loading carbines of the American Civil War. For example, Mayor Price from the 8th Iowa Cavalry Regiment stated that they are not worse than have lost men in the campaign by the worthlessness of the arm. 
Captain Bechtel of the 8th Ohio Cavalry also had bad opinion about the carbine because it becomes full after firing a few rounds so that the bridge could not be closed and it leaked gas. Lieutenant Jacob Hardin stated that they nearly put a man's eyes out every time they fire them, the powder burns their faces. But it is true that they leak gas. Just in the case of other percussion breech holding carbines that were not firing a metallic or rubber cased cartridge. But they did not burn the face of the soldier. Here are some extreme slow motion recordings of the barrel breech while firing. It is clearly visible that there is a strong gas blowout at the bottom, but the carbine spits a large amount of flashes upwards as well, also at the barrel and the breech gap, and also through the nipple. Let's talk a bit about the name of this carbine. So it is obvious that the first production batch can be called as a gross patent carbine or a cosmopolitan carbine as it was marked on the lock plate. From 1862, all the carbines that were using the Gwyn patent breech, they can be called a Gwyn and Campbell carbine. That's also quite easy. But all of these models were marked with the Union rifle words stamped into the receiver. It's also here which means that for all models you can use the Union Carbine words. But you know what? Just call them Grapevine Carbine because of the strange shape of the lever. My feelings about the Gwyn and Campbell Carbine are quite controversial. First of all, the action is not that bad. It is easy and convenient to operate. Of course it is leaking gas, but I really have to say that the Sharps is also leaking gas, which was considered the second best after the Spencer. This action is actually quite comparable to the Burnside, to the Sharps, to the Smith and to the Gallagher actions I already had a chance to fire. The action is strong and easy to operate. The loading method is quite convenient, it is just guiding the cartridge into the chamber. The length of the flash hole is quite short, so which means that the flash from the percussion cap can easily penetrate any percussion or linen cartridge, which gives a very secure ignition. This carbine is very easy to disassemble. You just have to unscrew this screw here and the complete breech block comes out for a proper and easy and fast cleaning. During the Civil War firearms are fed with black powder that leaves a heavy residue in the bore and in the action of the breech loading carbine. Being able to easily clean the arm was a must. The Gwyn and Campbell carbine is easy to fill strip. The breech block is easy to remove and the lock is held with the same method with two screws just as in the case of any contemporary side lock arms. So what my problems are, are the ergonomics of the rifle. First of all, the sights and the sight picture. The sight is just very small. It is very, very hard to get a proper sight picture with the V-notch of the rear sight and with the front sight. The second problem is that the hammer on the right side of the rifle is obstructing the view. It just covers a large portion of the field of view. The nipple is nearly in the middle of the bore, which means that it is also covering a large portion of the sight picture. It is a bit better when you cock the hammer, but still it is not as good as in the case of other Civil War carbines. My other problem is the grip. When you hold the rifle properly, so you have your trigger finger on the trigger, and try to make a side picture, you can't, because your thumb is just in front of your eyes. It is covering the rear side, which means that you have to put your thumb on the right side of the rifle. Then you don't have a proper hold, so you will need your left hand. But there is no forehand! Ah! I don't even understand how could this be designed like that? By the middle of the 60s, everybody knew that the future is for breech loaders. In January 1865, the Chief of Ordnance called for a discussion to select 
a metallic cartridge system for the future US Army. And they called for many entrepreneurs and called for many gun makers to submit their designs. Gwyn and Campbell also submitted two designs for this test. The first one was a single shot rifle firing a metallic case cartridge and the other one was a repeating rifle. Funnily, the single shot rifle did not work at all, it failed completely in the tests, while the repeater was quite good, but still they were, none of them were recommended for further testing. When the war ended, the US Army had to deal with huge quantities of obsolete military equipment, including 200,000 cavalry carbines. Out of the 200,000 cavalry carbines, there were around 5,000 Union carbines. There were different solutions for this problem. First of all, the soldier could buy his personal arm and carry it home for self-defense, home defense, or for hunting, or just as a memory. Second, large pies were sold to trading companies like Turner and Ross, uh, who was advertising one Union carbine for five US dollars in 1878. These guns actually played an important part in conquering the western areas of the country. Third, all the others that were left in the stocks, the Union Carbines, by the way, most of the Union Carbines were stored in the St. Louis Arsenal, they were sold out to companies like Bannerman at scrap metal price, who were then using them for filming and who were selling them from collectors. So the story of the Gwyn and Campbell Carbine is quite short, but still it plays an integral part of firearms history. And the designs, even if they look awkward or ugly, or we can call it whatever we want, they are still very, very, very interesting. The capping breech loader is faster than a muzzle loader, but it was probably more important that it could be loaded much more easily on horseback. But let's check now the rate of fire and the tactical accuracy with some good old fashioned mad minute shooting. Négy lövés volt, ugye? Four shots, I guess. Well, I was not the fastest thing on earth. The distance is only 30 meters, and all the four shots are, let's say, in the size of a human head, which is quite good, it's okay. But uh, four shots in a minute, it's not the fastest that you can do with a cavalry carbine like this. And I'm pretty sure that this carbine is also capable of a faster firing. But anyway, it was fun to shoot it. That's a neat little carbine. It looks ugly, feels ugly, but still it's a good... So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. You have been watching the Cap Handle YouTube channel. If you like what I do, then please subscribe, comment, like, share and follow the channel. This will help me to grow the channel to a level that was never seen before. If you wish to support me, you can do it through Patreon. I will be very grateful for that. You can also buy your products that you can find in our eBay store or in our own web store. All the links are below in the description area. So, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.